Hello, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's Hangout. And uh, hopefully you'll be getting the streaming video here in just a moment. So I wanted to uh, say hello to everybody. Also, uh, hello to Mr. Brian Short joining us today. Hey, Mark. How's it going? It's going good. If you uh, don't mind my usual uh, paranoia and check just to make sure the, the video starts streaming uh, fairly soon, let me know. Uh, and then, uh, Troy, welcome to you as well. Troy, your mic might have been off. <laughs> yes, it was. Hello, everybody. I was trying to read your lips, and uh, I think you said hello to uh, to everybody. So, uh, again, welcome uh, from from me as well. well this is Mark Silverman, and I actually hear myself now. So that must have been Brian streaming it, maybe. Not me. Oh, that was you. Okay, no problem. That's good. It's a good sign. It's, that means that we're actually uh, live with everybody. So, usual uh, status here. Uh, you guys can ask questions. This is uh, interactive, so we're more than happy to. Uh, answer any questions that you all have, type those into the chat roll there. You can put your name in, you can just be kind of anonymous, whatever you want to do uh, is perfectly fine. I'll maybe just have to address you as guest number 9,246, but that's perfectly fine as well. So, uh, Troy, how was the uh, the week of trading for you? Yeah, it was great. Am I on? Is my mic on? <laughs> is this on? Is this on? Yes. I have so many windows I'm juggling around. <laughs> yeah, it was a really good week, really strong. Uh, just steady as she goes. Um, lots of great forex trades. Lots of new ones setting up. Some hitting targets really quickly. Uh, the Dowie Mini on a tear. It's like just keeps winning today. Another great session. It was a good, good week. Good. Yeah. It seems to me, at least for what I was doing, I would say uh, energy futures was a highlight. What else was a highlight? Uh, agricultural was a highlight and stock DAX indices well. yeah the DAX right Brian yeah stock indices were were good too for the most part I think like the Russell and the DAX looked really good um, what about for you Brian kind of where were your highlights or what was kind of the key things yeah the highlight for the week obviously I mentioned it was the DAX and uh, really really strong performer uh, the downside for the week for me was silver uh, yeah. just really kind of uh, not doing much uh, so that's the good and the bad but uh, anyways that's the, the highlight of the week yeah, I think that's one of the strengths. Um, when you get to the point where you can trade multiple markets, you don't have to depend on one market to always be the thing that carries you home. And I noticed in our trading a lot this week, um, let's say like a silver would dig a little bit of hole, but it seemed like every day something came up. One day it was heating oil, one day it was the DAX, you know, another day like today was RB, unleaded gas. Something always seemed to kind of come to the rescue. And uh, though that can sometimes be frustrating when you've got you know, like one market, you feel like it's dragging you down. The good news is that it's nice to re remind yourself that you have some other markets that might be pulling you back up. And, and this way, we don't have to guess as much which markets uh, those are going to be when you're trading multiple markets. So um, what we like to do here is we all uh, usually present a little something to you that we've been thinking about during the week. Uh, and uh, so we'll kind of do that. I'm going to actually focus in on uh, the Keltner Bells today. Because uh, obviously, uh, you probably know, if you don't, you, you've probably seen an email or two on it. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, we have that out again to the public. Um, the last release was back in January, so here we are in May, about four months later. Uh, and, you know, whether you're interested in Keltner Bells or not, I'm not here to sell you on it. Uh, the Hangout really is for me to just kind of show you just sort of what's kind of neat about it as far as... Uh, you know, the way that it works, and maybe, if anything, uh, you'll get some ideas uh, for yourself or your personal trading uh, on how to use some of these pairs that I show you, um, or even Renko and Range. I mean, the charts will look a little different maybe than, than what you're used to. So hopefully, if anything, you just get a, an inspiration for, uh, you know, from it. Uh, certainly, you can ask questions on it, and then, you know, certainly, I'll, I'll give you the link if you want to learn more about it. That's, you know, certainly uh, something we can do. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen share. And uh, give me a moment to get that rolling. All right, and uh, Brian, if you could just kind of give me a, an audible, I don't see on the screen, you see the screen coming through? You're good. All right, cool. All right, so this funky looking chart is a Renko uh, chart. And if you're not familiar with Renko, the way I always like to describe it a little bit is like bricks stacked upon each other. Um, no overlap at all. So if you notice uh, all the boxes, um, basically every one is a fixed size. And this is the Euro US dollar. And these are all 10 pips. And the only way you can get a new bar 
is if you have a full 10 pips below the prior bar or a full 10 pips above. So if you kind of look over here and you see this is live in the market, there's a bar that is open and it's gone down maybe a pip or two. If it doesn't get all the way down to here and 10 pips totally below, it will not form a box. So it might come down a little bit, come back up, come back down, come back up. If it ends up rallying and going 10 pips above, you will only see the box that is up above. Uh, and I don't know if I actually have, have like anything I can draw with here to sort of give that an idea. Let's see, what could I use? Yeah, I'm not really sure, so I'm not going to bother with it. But if the, the point being, one thing that's a little bit weird about Renko for people is there literally can be price action that you'll never see on the chart. Right. So like I said, if this went up and down a little bit and ended up not closing down and then rallied up back up, you'll never see that it did dip down a little bit here. But that's fine because we're working only in full box increments. For instance, I will only get short when a box is completed. I'll only, of course, take my target on this short when it gets down on a completed box. So the way that we set up the Keltner Bells is we never have to worry about these little phantom you know, areas that don't uh, plot on the chart. So just understand a little bit what you're looking at uh, in this case. And I'll typically trade most markets either with a Renko or a range and sometimes both. And I'll, I'm going to go back and forth and show you, show you both. This is definitely swing trade. And what I want to kind of give you the idea is if you can see this trade triggered at 4.35 uh, in the morning. New York time. Now, one of the things that we talk about with Keltner Bells, and I think, you know, even one of the things that Troy will talk about in a little bit when uh, he covers some of his Forex trading, is we know these markets are open 24 hours a day, but it's impossible to catch setups 24 hours a day. I know some of you try, and I've done it too. You set up alerts, alarms, pager notices, you know, back in the day, then it's smartphone notices. It's just a nightmare. Your laptop is on your nightstand. I mean, it's no way to live, and it's very difficult to trade that way. So a concept that we teach uh, in the Keltner Bells is something called get in sync. And if you have Premier Trader University or Trend Jumper, you've heard of get in sync as well. So we use a very similar theory uh, in this market as well. And what that says is just because a trade triggered at 4.30 in the morning and I wasn't there to catch the initial trigger, nothing says that I can't go ahead and take that trade the next time I have an opportunity. Okay, and my opportunity is I only look for two checks every 24 hours. My idea here is to check one time spend from one to 10 minutes and then 12 hours later, give or take, check another time for one to 10 minutes. You know, what depends on the markets I'm trading and what's going on. So the neat thing about this trade is we had the opportunity until after eight o'clock New York time to get on board. So literally any time between 4.30 in the morning New York till you know, after eight o'clock and actually it, it bounced around here for a while. It's almost about a quarter to nine before it started to move to the downside. So it's just important to understand that's one of the advantages. And I do kind of have people, sometimes you start on Keltner Bells, I teach them this, and then it kind of drives them crazy to miss the trade in real time. They get very paranoid that they're gonna miss all the good setups. And the reality is somebody has been doing this for two plus years, it's just not the case. I would say that 75 to 90% of my trades are a get in sync on the Keltner Bells and none of them require me to break the rules, meaning, you know, have to trade at 12 o'clock, two in the morning, four in the afternoon, all these times that I typically personally don't trade. So I wanted you to kind of understand that as I start to show you how this works. And I'm, I'm gonna switch over here to a chart of the Frank Yen. So, uh, and this is a trade that's been uh, going for a while. So yesterday at about 8.06 in the morning, New York time, a short setup. Now I come in typically where you see the magenta. It's usually somewhere between 8 and 9 a.m. It tends to be these days for me, New York time, about 8.30 to 9. So what's kind of neat about this example, uh, as you can see here, is we have lots of time to get back, you know, get on board this trade as a get in sync, right? And I was able to just kind of take the trade and uh, I think it was about 8.47 or so where I had a little retrace and I filled, all right? Down below here, where you see the little thicker magenta dot, this is our target way down here. I mean, this is gonna be a, a sizable move from 105.48 down to one of, it's 100 and, I don't know, 35 pips or so, uh, if we get to target. My stop is way up here on the top of the screen, and you can see the trade really didn't go my way from here to here. That's a 12 hour stretch. Now, I do not check this market at all, and that's one way to stay young, 
you know, and keep your heart healthy is not to sit there and be paranoid and stressed out and check this market throughout the day. So where you see the blue, and maybe a little hard to see on your screen, but right where my arrow is, is the next time I came in, this was last night. So the amount of time I have to do on this market is like, huh, okay, well, there's nothing to do. I'm a little bit underwater. I haven't hit target. I haven't hit stop. And I haven't hit a level to lower my stop. And what I'm looking for is these are Keltner channels, all these funky lines. I know there's a lot of lines. Don't worry about what they are. All you pay attention to is the line at the very top and the line at the very bottom. In the case of a short, I need to have it get through the lower lines for me to be able to move my stop. So last night, there was just nothing for me to worry about. All right, so then throughout the night while I'm sleeping, it starts to go my way to some degree. I mean, it's not going crazy to the downside, but you can see by the morning, which is right here, 24 hours later, I've made a little bit of headway, right? Rather than losing some money, at that point, I'm making just a little bit. So this morning, you know, we can take a look at it and we can determine if there's anything else that we need to do with the trade. And the one thing I was able to do was to lower my stop uh, because we did touch on and, you know, by a little bit, go through the lower Keltner channel. So at this point, we're short this market and there's nothing else to do. So literally a five second check this morning, a five second check last night, that's about all I can do on this trade. And this is Frank Yen with a 15 pip range bar. So notice the difference if you're uh, not familiar with range. It's a lot like Renko as far as every bar is the same size, but the one big difference is you can have overlap. So you can have a bar that goes down a little bit, up a little bit, down a little bit. It'll plot every point and you'll get overlap. So think of it in a way like, you know, a Renko bar that has overlap. Uh, it's a really great way to look at the markets intraday. You know, you may know tick bars. You may know, of course, time intervals like five-minute bars. Um, this is a really unique way of looking at the markets. You get very clear-cut support and resistance. They respond extremely well to technical indicators because they're very fast when the market moves quickly. They slow down when the market moves slowly, which is the big fallacy and the real problem with time interval charts. They're forced to print no matter what's happening in the market. A range in a Renko bar is not forced to print no matter what happens in the market. Um, let me give you another example of like why this whole get in sync and taking these snapshots uh, can be so powerful. And actually, I'm going to go back to a Renko in this case just to sort of fluctuate back and forth. So on a Renko, uh, I want you to take a look at this trade. This was an interesting one that we finished yesterday. So way back originally, this trade triggered here at about 9.30 in the morning, uh, sorry, at, at night on May 28th. Uh, now, we have something that we call a trade zone. Again, this is something we teach you. You may have heard of it a little bit in some of our other uh, plans. Most of our trade plans on Trend Jumper and PTU, for instance, have hours that they're willing to take trades and hours that they're not. It's the same way for me in Forex Swing Trading. I'm not willing to take every trade whether it occurs any time over 24 hours. What I have found uh, in my work over thousands of trades is typically in a 24-hour period, there tends to be about 8 to 12 hours of time that trades have a much higher degree of success if they trigger during that time. If they trigger outside of that time, the odds of success goes way down. All right, so what we do is we say, wait, we need to make sure that this trade will trigger. And that just means that we get into the market inside one of these windows. You know, it's like if you trade the Russell E. Mini, we found trading from like 9.30 New York to 11.30 New York is the best time, right? It just is. Agriculturals, 10.30 to maybe 12.30 or 1, best time. They trade many, many more hours, but you'll find if you take the exact same trade system that was working great during those two hours, it may be very ineffective during those other hours. So it could be a mistake that you're all making. You may be following or trading a system that could be pretty decent, you're just trading it at the wrong time. So on this um, uh, trade for the New Zealand yen, we, on the magenta here on May 29th, we went ahead and we got in sync with it. Now I couldn't catch it originally at 3.15 in the morning because I am not gonna wake up ever at 3.15 in the morning. However, when I woke up in the morning, the market was bouncing around near the entry and whether I got it here or even a little later at 2.24 in the afternoon, I don't need to be around at 2.24 because all I had to do was place a sell limit right? That's all you have to do. Let your broker, that's the whole point, do the work, meaning place the trade in the system. And if we get the retracement, we'll get filled. Well, sure enough, right? We got the retracement here. Uh, five hours later, we got filled. It doesn't matter whether it happened four hours later or five hours later. By the time I look at this for the next time, and literally, 
I had no idea this field. I didn't care where I was at. I had my target in place and my stop in place. That's all I cared about. I'm trying to get down to here, by the way. So, you know, it's about a 90 pip move, I think. Um, so I come in on the evening of the May 29th, and one thing I'm able to do is lower the stop because you notice we got through the lower Kellner channel. And I would say about 75, maybe even 85%, well, let's say 75 to 85% easily of our trades, we get to lower the stop. There's always going to be the entry that we get no opportunity to lower the stop and we get a full stop out. But the cool thing is most of my losers are partial losses. All right. And that's really important because I'm going for some pretty big targets. So if I'm going for 90 pips here and I happen to lose 35 or 40 on a trade, if I go one and one, I'm doing great, right? If I go two and one and I've made 180 pips and lost on a trade and lost 40, I'm doing awesome. So that's another real big advantage with the Keltner Bells. Now, eventually, when I woke up here on May 30th, came in and looked at it, we had just hit target almost perfectly. Now, since then on this market, we've got this buy setup way up here. We're nowhere close to a setup at this point. And you may notice there's a setup right now. I am now outside my trade window, so I have no interest at all in taking another trade uh, on this market. Let me show you one other example uh, on a range bar, just again to sort of get that feeling for it a little bit, that fluctuation back and forth. Um, maybe I'll show you two situations here. The first one being uh, Euro New Zealand. Um, let me just kind of show you. So we were coming off this uh, really nice move uh, from uh, May 29th. We had this setup. So just a couple days ago. Uh, and just to give you an idea, same thing. I came in during the magenta. The setup's already there. So we end up going long on that trade you know, let's say 1.5955, and I'm trying to get to 1.6115. It's 160 pips, by the way. Um, when I came in on the evening of the 29th, not much had happened. I did raise my stop because you may notice we did reach the upper Keltner channel. So I took my stop rule, and I was able to go from down here all the way up to, it was approximately right here. I don't have the exact value in front of me, but we went from pretty good size stop to a pretty small stop. So at that point, I think I was risking about 35 pips to yield 160 pips. Now that wasn't my initial stop. I need to give it room to start to develop because you'll notice right after I entered, it went against me a bit before it took off to the upside. Now not much happened throughout the evening of the 29th, eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, but about three o'clock in the morning, New York time, you know, so eight o'clock in the morning in, in Europe, GMT, it just took off to the upside. And it actually hit target at 7.30 in the morning, New York, that's about when my alarm goes off. So, you know, I know Brian's probably already been up for two hours, but that's about when I'm about to get started and uh, get the coffee going. So it's really nice a lot of times. This happens all the time to walk in to a winning trade. I mean, it's one of the greatest feelings that there is, and it happens all the time. Now, there are times that I will miss opportunity, all right? So this is a trade from this morning at 3.30 in the morning New York time. Now, those of you in Europe or those of you who start early, hey, you can catch this trade if this is when you typically take what I call, it's called your snapshot. What I don't want you to do again, right, is turn this into a 24-hour a day ordeal. So I check between eight and nine. There's no chance that I can get this trade, right? So let me put a horizontal line here and look where when I came in, where we were at. So here's where we were at when I came in. There was actually a short setup. Now, it's against the trend, and I'm not going to get into all the rules, but this short setup actually got invalidated. Uh, we wouldn't take it on this market because this market, you don't want to fight the trend. Very easy. It's an indicator down below that tells you don't take a short. But I have no opportunity in this case to get in sync. Right? I showed you several get in syncs. This one, for me personally, I just missed it. I don't have an opportunity because I already have a short setup here that I'm not going to take, and it's actually higher than the buy. So there's that doesn't make any logical sense. So this is a great looking trade right now, right? It's doing really well. It hasn't quite hit the target yet, but look how close it is. That's another 160 pip move. So this is a reality. There's going to be times where I'm just going to simply miss a trade setup. But the flip side is awesome because there's plenty of times that a trade triggers early and it may hit a stop out. I haven't even woken up yet. Let me give you one more example of that. I think it was on the Euro US dollar, if I remember correctly, yesterday. There was this setup at uh, 7.45 in the morning, ended up hitting stop. I start right in here about 8.30. I placed the trade, but you notice it never traced back down. It never retraced. So I save a loser. So I absolutely miss some winners, but I actually also filter out some losses. In the end, I don't have to obsess and trade this market 
throughout all kinds of you know hours, day and night. And just to give you a little idea of the favorite pairs, uh, just to sort of go through this, like I said, Euro Yen is a pair that we really do very well with, but I would say it's probably one of the weaker. And when I say weaker, it's profitable, but the best pairs in range bars, let me kind of bring this up a little bit. I'll just read them off because I know they're a little hard to see. But where I make the most par profits on range bars is the Euro Aussie, E-U-R-A-U-D, the Pound CAD, GBP, C-A-D, the Euro CAD, E-U-R-C-A-D, New Zealand Yen, NZD, JPY, and one of the recent really great ones has been the Pound Frank. That's been doing great. I just started that one about 60 days ago or so. It's been doing wonderful. I get some partial losses, and then boom, I get you know really big wins on it. So it's been an excellent one. And of course, the Euro, uh, Euro New Zealand. It's been a long time favorite. Uh, those are the best on range. On Renko, it's pretty similar, but actually a little different. Um, just to give you an idea, um, Euro US is good. Uh, definitely, Euro US on Renko does well. Um, and I would say Pound New Zealand uh, does very well. New Zealand Yen. And the New Zealand US is actually very good. It's just uh, doesn't trade very frequently. So it gets me 80 pips several times a month. It's just not a high frequency uh, type of market. So I wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of exposure to uh, the Keltner Bells, uh, Renko and Range. Uh, this has been out here for two plus years. Um, you know, it's been extremely consistent month in and month out. I, I just don't really remember a bad month. There's different varying degrees of how we'll do in given months. Uh, but if you just approach this, or even think about this in your own trading, whether you know you do Keltner Bells or not. Think about it with any of the net pick systems. It's all about getting in, getting out, getting done, and us not trying to turn this into a long-term thing. The second point I need to make is we're in control of these trades. We're not trying to turn on some software that you you know bought for 77 bucks that's somehow going to magically right turn you know your life into a full-time income automatically. So there is some control that we have over this. But believe me, any professional trader is going to want to have that control once you understand the rules overall. So um, that's about all that I have. I don't know, Brian or uh, Troy, do you have any questions on anything you saw or anything that uh, kind of comes to mind based upon what I showed them today? Well, there are a few good points that I thought you made also that um, maybe I could just reiterate uh, apart from from the way Ranko works and range and, and how, how well you can trade Forex, but one of the things, or a few things that you did were really important, of course, were applying rules. You're not just trading, you know, turning it on and trading, you're taking the time, well, of course you designed it, but let's just say you're someone who bought, bought the strategy, you need, to learn, you need to learn it and you need to learn the rules that go with it because the rules are part of the strategy. Um, and you have some rules there on how you manage your money, for example. And so you, even if you get one winner and one loss, you're still way ahead, right? So that's yeah. really important because I know a lot of people um, who just start out with Trend Jumper and they don't take the time to learn it. They just start trading the si signals or the symbols as they show up, all the dots, and they don't have the kind of uh, success that they should have because they're just not, they didn't bother to learn the rules also. Rules are very important. Another thing I thought you said that was really critical it was how important it is to stay alive. I mean, think about it. If you're a trader, you want to live, right? Because the longer you live, the more money you're going to make because you're living longer, you can trade more. I thought that was a good point. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. I mean, here's like a Euro US again where if somebody wants to break the rule and get up hours and check this thing for hours on end, they can. But I was able to get in on this short, you know, at my normal time, and and it may or may not break down to full target. Kind of doesn't matter because you know I'm able to reduce the risk now. The next time I check it, um, and it's really just ends up being as simple as that. So um, yeah, let me hand it off uh, to Brian now, and I know Brian's got some stuff to uh, share with y'all. Okay, thanks, Mark. That's good. I just want to add a point there that you know you just gotta stick to the rules. Uh, I work the support on Keltner Bells along with Ron. Ron works a lot of the support too. And probably one of the most common uh, mistakes new people to Keltner Bells make is over managing those trades. Um, it's so tempting. You, you know, you put a trade on, you want to you wanna know how it's doing. Just uh, resist that, I guess, uh, that, that constant uh, looking at the chart. Just, uh, you know, put your trade on and, and try to walk away. That's the great thing about swing trading is it should be uh, less stress than uh, you know uh, the active, more intraday type approaches. So 
let uh, let that swing trade strategy, whatever it is, whether it's Keltner Bells or something else, let it do its work and uh, try not to fret those trades uh, in, in the process. So anyways, that's what I'll add to that. Um, I want to just kind of cover a few things uh, from our trading uh, this week. I always try to do that, uh, pick out a couple of things that uh, I thought were good uh, learning points. And so this is going to be a, a little bit of a, a teaching session, uh, especially for those that have uh, the PTU already. And uh, for those that uh, might be new on the Hangout, Mark and I trade an account together. Um, and uh, we're very active in that process. Uh, he trades RBNHO. I'm responsible for silver and uh, the DAX. Sometimes we mix it up a little bit. Sometimes I have them all. Sometimes he has them all. So we go back and forth uh, uh, in that regard. It's also great. I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, um, uh, to partner up with someone. It's uh, it's really kind of cool the dynamic that happens there. You go back and forth. You can uh, you know, banter back and forth about setups, whether to make this adjustment, whether not to, and it's very beneficial uh, in that way. If you can find someone, uh, accountability is also another great aspect to partnering with someone. Uh, because uh, you've got someone to answer to and you can't get off the track, so to speak, um, and make you know stupid, silly mistakes. You, you're accountable to somebody. You've got to kind of answer at the end of the day, at the end of the week, uh, on your actions. So again, I just want to encourage you, if you have that opportunity, seek out someone that you can partner up with. So what I want to do is show you an example on silver this week, a situation that I ran into, and then I also want to show you uh, trade on the DAX from today and, and kind of my thought process on that particular trade. So let me bring up uh, my chart on silver and uh, before I do that we use, uh, Mark and I use Trade Assist uh, for our trading uh, and you've got to, one of the things that I'm going to recommend here you, you've got to do is you've got to be in front of your computer when Trade Assist is on because things can happen, right? It's your job as the trader to be in front of the screen, make sure that everything is working the way it should be. And I've got an example here on silver where this week, because of a red rated news report, things went awry. And so you've got to get back in sync very quickly. <clears throat> and so I want to walk through the process and uh, kind of tell you what happened so that those that have trade assist are aware. I know last week uh, Dave, Dave B was on the call and uh, got a lot of people excited about trade assist. I got many emails this week, people uh, getting signed back up for trade assist. So uh, I wanted to bring this particular point up and kind of walk through it. So I'm going to bring up my chart on silver. This is from yesterday. And one second, let me screen share. So this is silver from yesterday, and this is actually a second trade uh, on the session. The first trade was a loser, so we're looking for a second trade. Let me kind of cover for those that aren't familiar with uh, PTU. Uh, what you're looking at here is a uh, momentum bar. It's a, a four cent momentum bar. Okay, that's one of the ways we trade with PTU, the, the PTU methodology. And uh, so the plus sign here represents the trade setup at 830. And our entry here was uh, 2274. Now, um, the one thing I wanted to point out is that uh, you've got to understand what reports are happening during uh, your trade zone. And yesterday, we had a red rated report at uh, 8.30, a couple of them actually. We have the, the preliminary GDP and the unemployment claims. And what that caused on the chart was what I call the splat of bars, okay? And when that happens, you'll notice here as I cursor over these bars from, from here, actually going from, from right here to roughly right in here, those bars all printed in the same minute or uh, you know same few seconds. And so what happened is the automation kind of got out of sync. When I heard this trade go off, um, I looked down at my uh, Ninja Trader and it, it was not, we were not in this trade. That happened so quickly that the order was, was rejected, okay? And not only that, it actually automation had my order 
for some reason, down at uh, 62. Remember, I said it was supposed to be 74. So I had to actually, in this case, shut automation off, trade assist off, and manually get back in sync. And so that's what I ended up doing in this case. Now, that happened uh, for me. What happened by the time I was able to get the order in was right in this area. And so I was able to put a buy stop in in this case. And I didn't put it at 74, by the way. I, I make a key level adjustment and went to 76 on this trade. So that's where I ended up getting filled. And you can see here, price did come back up and then ultimately took us out of our target. So that was a nice winning trade. But my point here is um, had I not been, had I walked away and been golfing and, um, and, and not in front of the screen, uh, this could have been potentially a problem, a huge problem, uh, because not only would I not have been in the trade, uh, the trade assist would have put this order out here and ultimately uh, you know, taken me uh, short at this point. And so that's, again, why you've got to be in, if you have trade assist with us, you've got to be in front of the screen, monitoring your trade setups, making sure everything is working 100%. Uh, because there are, there's just things, you know, you might say, well, why don't you program in the uh, trade assist to, uh, you know, to work around these kind of things. We cannot program for every potential situation that might be thrown at us. And uh, the, the, the splat of bars really is an area that can cause automation problems. We've seen it in the past. So just to wrap up on this particular situation, a couple things. Make sure at the beginning of the session, you know where your red rated reports are. That's uh, a likely suspect for the price action where we get you know the burst. So just understand where those are. Um, if it's in your trade plan to work around those, then you're going to turn automation on and off to work around it potentially. And um, by the way, I did turn automation on after I entered the trade again. I turned automation back on and got in sync. So that was the, the nice part about that. All right, so that's that. I want to take you next to a DAX trade from today's session. Hey, and, Brian, uh, can, I, can I interrupt you for a moment? Because yes. uh, it just it, it reminds me of something. Um, we always call it trade assist, right? There right. is a really specific reason. We had a long, a number of long talks about this because we're a business. You know, I'm not going to deny that we're here to also sell products and services. I mean, you know, we, we do this out of the goodness of our hearts, and you pay us for that, right? Um, but the reality is it's so much easier to market calling this automated trading or a robot or autopilot. I mean, so much easier. We could sell so much more, but we're calling it trade assist for that reason. It's incredible. I mean, I wouldn't quote unquote live without it. You heard from David last week. It feels the same way. But I mean, Brian makes a great point that no matter what, there's always going to be things that you are going to do better uh, than a computer in this case. And so, um, just keep that in mind. It just kind of reminded me again, you know, the trade assist wasn't a marketing gimmick. We actually, in a way, made it much harder on ourselves. Um, in, in a way, we, we sort of taken away uh, the, the glamour of the product, but it's much more true to form how you're actually going to use it in your trading. But I know, like, for me this week, um, you know, the wife being out of town, a couple times I had to, you know, run my daughter to school. It's pretty darn nice because I remember six months back when we were trading and we didn't have it. I would have to call you. I'd have to hand it off to you. It'd be stressful. I'd be rushing back. Yeah. I didn't even worry about it. It executed perfectly. And, you know, I'm not going to leave it alone for three hours, but it was no problem for 30 minutes. Anyway, yeah. just want to make the point. Good point. So uh, next I just want to talk about the DAX uh, from this morning and kind of the thought process on uh, the, the only trade we had on the session, which uh, did end up being a winner. But uh, inside of that trade, um, there was uh, some thoughts that I had that I just want to kind of uh, talk to mainly PTU students. Um, we'll, we'll get the most benefit out of this. So let me bring up my screen share again. All right, so what you're looking at here is a chart of the DAX. Again, this is PTU. Uh, the PTU approach, if you're not familiar with uh, our approach, the, it's really pretty easy. And uh, the, the plus sign here on the chart designates where we get in. The dots at the top here designate our target objective. In this case, this is a long. And the red dots here designate our stop on the trade at, uh, you know, at setup time. 
So the, the thing that was interesting about this particular trade is you'll notice that we get triggered into this trade, right? Price action goes in our favor. Let's just uh, see here where the entry was. A entry was 8361.5, okay? And believe me, I looked to the left here. You can see a swing point right here. That's too big of an adjustment, in my opinion, to work around that, so I did not. Um, and probably was lamenting that right in here, right? Because price went up just above our sw that last swing and then took a pretty sharp dive to the downside. But anyways, this is where I got in this morning. So the thing that I want to kind of uh, point out to those that are in PTU that, that I'm a big fan of is when you've got this situation where a trade just triggers you in goes a little bit in your favor but not quite to the 1x level and then reverses you know a lot of times when uh, when the trend power is is kinda of doing what this is doing oscillating back and forth a lot of times we can get a pretty quick reversal and to me my opinion on this and I, I teach this whenever we do the class is I like to give this particular trade every opportunity to work out and be you know uh, potentially successful so when when this started when this happened right here where we get the reversal inside our original stop which was right here I'm gonna move that reversal point to the original stop not only that you're gonna see here that there's a swing point a swing low at 41 so my stop on this particular trade was well below this uh, this swing level here at 39 and it stayed there notice a few bars later we get an improved reversal and this one was a little more of a debate for me all right because we got an improvement and it's a pretty big stretch but I was again trying to give this trade it hadn't progressed very far in our favor I'm trying to give this trade every opportunity now notice it never even came close all I'm doing here is just kinda of walking through my thought process on this particular trade and this could or you know if price would have pulled back further may or may not have come into play but again I just wanted to kind of point out the the way I like to add my art of trading to this process and uh, the thought process that I was going through this morning on this particular DAX trade so the DAX very very solid for us uh, this week as far as performance goes um, probably one of my favorite markets at this point uh, it's moving very very well and uh, giving us good performance week in and week out. I'm sure Mark will share uh, the the worksheet here if he has it updated uh, that shows the performance uh, on the week. So, Mark, that's what I have for the. Oh, you know, I guess I'm getting the no on that. So, Mark, that's what I yeah. have for this week. <laughs> Didn't get around to it. I know I can see Adnan's with me today. He he kind of understands since I have him helping me out a little bit with some testing. So. Yeah, that's the ultimate time suck. So your your day and night is pretty much gone. We've been working on some various things. So I was working on silver today, some modifications. But uh, anyway, maybe uh, next time every couple of weeks I like to do it. So let me hand it off to uh, Mr. Troy Noonan. Great, thank you. And uh, I've got a few different things I want to talk about. Um, but what I wanted to point out too is I was watching Brian's presentation and, and the splat of bars and it just brought to mind this this thing that I'm always reminded of, and that is with trading. There's always a consequence with every decision you make. I mean, um, you know, it's a it's a zero sum game as far as win and loss. There's going to be a winner on a trade and a loser on the trade, right? But there's also a, a, this there's this um, cause and effect that always happens with whatever decision you make, right? If you move the stop to cut risk you know perhaps you're going to get out of the trade too soon and you're not going to get the full reward and if you keep the bigger stop for the potential bigger reward you might end up with a bigger loss and with range bars it's a bar that's outside of time it's just based on the price moving right so if there's something in the market that's moving the price up and down you're going to get that splat of bars because there's no um, it, it's it's just independent of time and if you get the benefit of range bars, which we all know are those beautiful trends, you will also sometimes get then the effect of what occurs when you get the splat of bars. You're not going to get that with a five-minute chart, for example. But on the five-minute chart, you're not going to get the dynamics that a range bar gives you. So it's just something to always think about with whatever, every time you make a decision, always think about the consequence of the decision you're making. Because if it has to do with risk, if it has to do with reward, 
those are all really important. If it has to do with the art of trading, are you being too big of an artist? That's why we always talk about you know 10% art, and you try to even reduce that down to 5% and have some of that built into some rules that can now be mechanical, like our key level adjustments. And I want to show you um, something that I'm doing now with the Forex swing trading, because one thing I've learned, and I've had to learn it kind of through trial and error in the hard way, is that I'm using one broker's charts to, pay, to place trades on another broker's platform. And they, you know, the price quotes don't, they're not always the same, and the spreads are always changing. So I'll show you that in a minute, but I want to show you something else really quickly before I switch over, and that's what's behind me here. If you can see this, I'll try to pull it closer. Can you, can you guys see that okay? This is a USB monitor, and it's super light, and you just plug it into the USB, and it reorients itself from horizontal to vertical, which for me is really important and something I really have grown to become dependent upon. You can't see one of my other monitors is a tall 24 inch that's portrait oriented. Um, of course this didn't stretch down but the point is if you're trading with a dome or a ladder and you have a nice long vertical monitor then when you place your trade you know you should be placing OCO or OSOs with brackets you can easily move your stops and targets up and down. You can see the whole trade. And I don't know if you've ever tried a portrait-oriented monitor, but it does make trading a lot easier. I manually trade. I don't use Trade Assist just because of the style of, of, of trading that I do. And so the, ha the, the vertical monitor is, is just gives me a lot of flexibility, and you can layer different... Um, different domes, different matrices, or I use the thinkorswim ladder, so it's easy to click on one to the other, and you could easily trade multiple markets like that uh, with the vertical. Anyway, that little monitor there um, is very inexpensive, and it's super light, and it fits right into the case that your laptop would fit into. So I thought that might be interesting for people. Um, another thing I want to talk about is just uh, uh, as a point Mark brought up, and it's something we talk about all the time: the whole net pick style of getting in, getting out, getting done, and and living longer. You know, um, trading less. Less is more. It really is. Uh, today, the Dowie Mini had one trade, picked up 44 points. Um, this week, it made 181 points with Trend Jumper, and on there was there weren't any sessions. Uh, of more than two or three trades. I mean, there were only seven trades this week, and it won five. Yesterday was one trade, 69 points. And then Monday and two, or not Monday, but Tuesday and Wednesday, the first trade of the day was a loss. But then it won really good on the second trade, and power of quitting won, 181 points with, with just one trade. If you were to keep trading, you know what? You would have had losses. You might have hit some winners. Would you have done as well? You might have. You would have worked a, a whole lot harder. And it's you know questionable if you would have done as well. You might have not. You might have given the money right back to the market. But why not just trade less? And as your account grows, increase your position size. A lot of traders think, gee, I just got to trade more. I got to trade more. But you don't. You need to just quit positive on a steady basis. And as your, as your position grows, as your account grows, you don't work harder. You just increase your size according to a real smart risk allocation, 1% or 2%. And that 1% or 2% can get very large as your account grows, but it still is very small in relationship to your account. And so you, you could always maintain a comfort zone and thus live longer and do better as a trader. So um, that's why we've adopted that style. and That's why you're going to continue hearing us uh, talk about it why we work it into all our trade plans, while it, it actually is part of the art of trading, it's become a mechanical rule, and it's just something that is part of our system's trading because it's, it's a rule. It's not a dot on a chart. It's still a rule that we follow that makes our systems uh, as successful as they are. So with that, let me grab my screen share really quick. Hey, Troy, let me ask you real quick. Uh, sure. Somebody was wondering about the, the model of the monitor. Oh, you know what? I don't even know. AOC, I bought it from um, Easy Trading Computing. 
uh, Eddie, you know, you guys know Eddie probably. He's a, he's a good guy, and he got it to me really quick. I'm going on, on a vacation, as you know, and I retired the old horse and decided to get a new uh, laptop because um, I'm just asking more and more of, of my equipment, and I had to kind of get something custom built and uh, learned about this monitor. So I, I didn't know if I was going to have to schlep around my other old world HDMI monitor and carry a big old suitcase and I really didn't want to do that so um, necessity being the mother of invention and now I learned this one is vertically oriented too it's just all the better so. Cool. Hey, uh, uh, John uh, Osborne's got a question maybe it's something you're going to cover he says uh, I'm looking for more info about the modified stop where the stop is moved when the first exit is reached do you uh, set the stop to the plus entry, you know, the entry price, when the level one dot or uh, L1 dot is reached? And I'm assuming this is uh, future swing, yeah? I, I don't know for sure. I just confirmed that it was a trend jumper, and uh, that's a question that he had asked. Uh, had asked. Okay, well, there's different trade plans. Uh, with the day trading, um, the generic plan, you want to go to the one and a half X and you want to put your first target if you're using the pro version of SS uh, of Trend Jumper. If you're using the pro version, I mean there's the standard version, um, then you're just you could do it at the second target. It's just the calculators work differently. Um, yeah, it's probably a little complicated to explain because it's different from from market to market. But I am going to show you some forex swing trading and I'll explain to you how I'm moving my stops. Um, and I want to also talk a little bit about the rolling add-on trades because they can be very profitable. Um, I get questions a lot of times about aren't you concerned about the additional risk when you're stacking more positions on the same market and, and the answer is yes of course I am but I also have built into my rules a way to manage and mitigate that risk so that I am kinda having my cake and eating it too by um, trying to give that trade every chance it has to work out but also just being a little more uh, aggressive with my risk management as I continue to add to my position. So um, let's see. Let me let me. I'll show you the the rolling add-on last. I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm doing with my how I'm setting my orders. And this is a really good example here on this Aussie US. Uh, this trade, believe it or not, it looks like it stopped out. Um, Brian, let me know if you could see that. I try to make the dots bigger. Um, the stop was right below this green line. There's a blue dot right there. And it's two pips above the green dotted line. Okay, and that's coming all the way back from here. All the way back from the four, uh, 17th of April. And along the way, I'm adding to my position and I'm managing these positions a little more tightly. But this trade here and one other, we're following these dots all the way down. And it looks like it stabs up and would have stopped out because the stop, the printed stop, is at 96.864, right? I'd round that up to 96.87 normally, but I do a little bit more than that. I'm also looking to my left and I'm looking to see if there's any little um, near-term support and resistance levels to work around. So one bar over, there's this wick that goes up and it makes a new little swing level, and that one is up at 96, okay? Now this is multi hundred plus hundreds of pips, ten pips here or there. I don't really care about. I'm definitely going to push my stop up above nine six, right? Because why would I put it at eight six if I have a little resistance level I could try to hide it behind? Okay. And but the thing is, if I'm at nine six, then I'm already below you know ninety seven hundred, which is a pretty major key level. So now I'm looking to get above 9,700, and I had my stop up at 97,066. I even add a fractional pip more, and then I add my spread on top of that because I'm buying back my, you know, to get out of the trade, I have to buy, right? This is a short, and you always have to add spread to your short, I mean to the buy side, whether you're exiting a short or entering a long. So... Notice how, I don't know if you could see this, I don't know how to make the wicks bigger, but it's stabbed as high up as 96964, and it would have stopped me out if I didn't make that little extra adjustment. 
But I always add, I, I, I used to hate the fifth digit, you know, the extra digit when they started uh, showing those. But now I've learned to kind of use them to my advantage. And I'm typically adding six tenths of a pip or I'm subtracting six tenths of a pip to try to hide my entries, hide my stops just a little bit out of reach, a tiny bit more. And so if I didn't go above the 9700, let's say I was just going above this little resistance level here, well that's at um, 959, um, I'm sorry, 95949. So it's like not, uh, 96949, right? So I'm automatically going to go to 9696. I'm going to get it above the 5. But I'm also adding another fractional pip. I'm going 6 tenths of a pip higher. So I would go to 96966, six, okay? And, I, and then I'm always wondering, gee, I wonder if that's ever going to make a difference. This bar, this green bar that looks like it stopped this trade out, got as high as 96964. And so by hiding it 6 tenths of a pip up at 96966, I literally would have survived that trade by 2 tenths of a pip. Okay, the problem is, is that I'm trading through um, Awanda within an MT4 platform. I'm not trading through TradeStation. The quotes aren't always going to be the same. And so I, I add extra on top of my stops and, and entries. And so I actually did have it up at 97066 and survived. And I'm still actually going, still cooking on that trade. And who knows how much further down it could go. Maybe it'll come up and stop me out, but I've the whole the whole uh, philosophy is you want to give the trade every chance it has to succeed, and it's that whole cause and effect thing. A little extra risk by moving the stop up gives me the chance for a whole lot more reward. And for me, it's just an easy decision to make. So anyway, um, if there's any questions about what I'm doing with with uh, entries and stops, you know, I could answer those. But basically, I'm just going looking to get a. Uh, I make my key level adjustments or chart level adjustments. In this case, I looked to the left and I saw that the little chart level adjustment. But then I look to push it up around the next five or zero, and then I add the fractional pip on top of that and the spread. So that's kind of how I'm doing that. Um, now, as far as the rolling add-ons go, I mark my trade so I know where my primary trade is, my add-on one. If the add-on one stops out, the primary trade stays in. The next trade will be add-on one again. That's what I mean by rolling add-ons. It depends on how many live trades I have going. And with each new add-on I put as I'm building these positions, I'm being a little more aggressive I'm being more conservative, I should say, but I'm more aggressive with my stops. I start trailing the faster line, the confirmation line. I start doing it sooner. So when the, when the guest, Mark, asked about the stop and how I'm moving my stop, it really depends on the position I'm in. Because if I'm in my first primary position, I'm not really in a hurry to move my stop at that first target. I'm just working around the jump line and trying to reduce my risk a little bit if it's appropriate, depending on where it's at. Once I get to the middle target, then I'm locking in a pip and I just want to have a risk-free trade. I've already taken some profit at target one, target two, the rest is risk-free. Now, when I go to the add-on trades, I, I'm more aggressive. I do it differently. And each sub subsequent add-on, whether it's add-on one or add-on two or add-on three, I'm being more aggressive and a lot of times that's kind of got me out of trades that would have been much larger winners but I'm trying to protect my original profit so it's about again that cause and effect every decision has a consequence but I'm trying to stay in the trade I've already got live positions anyway but and and not risk giving it all back and every now and then you just hit on all cylinders and you know you hit the grand slam like on this one the Aussie US and then the, the newest one too that this one is not new, but this latest trade is is the Euro New Zealand. And if you're doing the the rolling add-ons, and if you know what I'm talking about, it looks like you have one, two, three, four live trades going, but you don't. You only have the the primary trade still going. The add-on one is still going because um, the add-on one, I I trail the faster line, which I made thicker here, the confirmation line, but only when I get to that first target. And then when I get to the third target, I'll revert 
to the jump line for add-on one. Okay, and so that one never did when it came down below this the confirmation line. It didn't stop out yet because it hadn't yet reached target one. So it's still going. So I got two positions still going. Then the pink trade is add-on number two. Add-on number two, as soon as I hit that first target, I'm trailing the fast-moving confirmation line. So that one hit the first target, but then it stopped out with a partial with the rest. So that means this next trade is add-on two again. That's what I mean by a rolling add-on. And that one triggered in and in one day hit target one, target two, target three. It's trailing the fast confirmation line. And so there's literally three live trades now, all at risk-free, trailing on up. And again, this is a, a pretty massive trade, actually. Um, so anyway, that's just a little insight on on how I'm using the trend jumper with with the day trades. You know, again, I'm looking at these charts um, once a day is when I'm placing my trades. But when I'm in here day trading in the morning, I'm going to look at it before I start my session because if I Notice I'm hitting targets or what have you. I'm going to move and protect my position, especially when I'm in those add-ons. I'm not always going to wait for the bar to close. Um, to you know, I don't want to hit some targets and have it come all the way back and stop me out because that's happened too. So um, anyway, a bunch of hodgepodge of information there for you. Great, thank you, Troy. Appreciate that. And let me see if there's any other uh, unanswered questions. Um, there's one here from uh, Carlos that I'll uh, put into the uh, the chat here. Um, what does it say? It says, when uh, swing trading, how do you discriminate between pairs that share a currency? In other words, for yen pairs, for example, how do you choose to trade one over another if you want to choose one pair but two or more of them have setups? Um, it's a good question, and I think it's about state uh, – um, it's about – progressively adding pairs as you go. I don't think you want to just jump out the the chute just full guns of blazing trading 15 20 pairs. I think what you want to do is come up with a good basket of 5 6 7 pairs that are as uncorrelated as possible and then little by little add another pair, add another pair. Eventually it's nice to have multiple yen pairs for example and they don't all trade the same. They they are correlated but they move at a different rate, they have a different cadence. I showed an example where the Euro Yen didn't quite hit that first target and had a losing trade a few few weeks back when there were those big huge green bars shooting up, but the Aussie Yen and some of the other Yen pairs did hit those targets and had a completely different result. And so, you know, it all boils down to back testing. It really does if you really want to do this right you pick one pair and you go back X amount of time I think if you go back a year year and a half and you start stepping through the charts plotting the trades thinking through every single setup so that you're learning the strategy learning the maneuvers you're doing it all in the comfort of safety you're getting that funny feeling when you put in three losses in a row but then you hit the big trade that all of a sudden you're ahead again and you learn like that and then you have now belief built in and you see that this one pair wow it really is working it's really producing despite the ups and downs then you do that with a second pair that's completely unrelated uncorrelated and little by little and it does take time but you know we're in this business for the long haul this is just what you do to be successful in any business you work hard at it and you I like to set goals so when I hit certain goals that triggers the rite of passage for me to add something new to my trade business, some new progression. You know, maybe I just back tested this pair. Now I've earned the right to begin trading it because I see how it moves, what it does, what the results have been. And little by little, you might say, you know what, the Euro US, gee, that just doesn't really produce. Or the Swiss US, you know, I looked at a year and a half worth of trades and it's just kind of like a, only up a little bit where all these other pairs, some of these other, others are just vastly profitable and continue to to do well I could tell you this I could tell you that and then you're gonna hit three losses in a row on one of the hottest pairs there is and you're gonna throw it out and not be because you don't have a belief structure that you've established for yourself and um, I just can't reiterate that enough I don't really know how else to answer um, this question that that's my answer 
Troy, you're always a man of so few words. Yep. But I think in there was uh, was a lot of good advice uh, and uh, and your answer. Uh, Mario was saying to perhaps to look at different yen pairs and see what chart looks best. I've kind of found there's just not as much correlation as you think um, between various pairs. You can get very different results even at the same time. So and then there's also certain ones like to Mario's point that just are performing better, you know, than others. Like uh, I know in Kelter Bells, you know, just over the course of two years, there's certain JPY crosses that have been very, very consistent and other ones that haven't. So it's more of a choice uh, to being where the best opportunities are. So that is going to bring us to the end of another Hangout. We don't want to go too much over uh, this time. So, uh, Troy, what do you have uh, in store for the weekend? What's next? Um, packing. <laughs> right. Troy's got a little bit of a, an adventure upcoming. Where, where are we going? Where are we all going? Well, I'm going to be over in Western Europe, pretty much. I'll be in uh, Holland and then down into France. I don't know if I'm going to jump over to England or not, but I might. It's going to be spontaneous. Very nice. It's uh, Troy's uh, 2013 European boondoggle adventure. <laughs> No, it sounds exciting. There. Yeah, and no, it'll be great. And he's actually going to be, uh, uh, like he says, doing. Uh, we'll be doing a, a, a live demo next Thursday, and so we'll be checking in with Troy. And I don't know if you've got any time in the in the trend jumper room scheduled or not, but uh, that's cool. What about for you, Brian? Well, this weekend I'm batching it. Uh, the wife's gone uh, with my middle daughter, and uh, so it's just me and my youngest daughter. So I'm sure we'll find something to to get in trouble and and, and get into this weekend. So we'll see. Very nice. I've got the same problem going on. My wife has also gone on a on a business trip, so got to play Mr. Mom at this point. Anyway, and then I'm going to go run out and play some tennis right now, so the heck with all of you. Uh, let me see. There's uh, a couple other quick questions here. Edward, what is the difference between Trend Jumper and Trend Jumper Pro? Make it brief, Troy. Trend Jumper Pro and Trend Jumper are, um, well, the Pro just has a few more tools, uh, does some things for you. Um, but you trade it the exact same way, and, and um, my preference is you learn Trend Jumper with the standard first anyway, and then you can decide if you want to go to Pro. But a few more dots on the chart to look at. Cool. All right. Uh, I think that's going to wrap it up. We're here again, same time, same place. Uh, Troy, I don't think you'll be with us, but uh, Brian, we should uh, work on getting uh, maybe Mike in here or Ron or Will or somebody else, so we'll... Um, look to do that, have kind of have, have them in here and hear from, from one of the other coaches. So uh, guest 995 is saying Dow is selling off hard. See, we're not even paying attention to the markets because we're done on the day right now, which is nice, but good to know. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Troy.